Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Cassie Maziz, and good morning to others who are um, in the in the USA. It's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, the association between Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and gastrointestinal problems. We're going to be discussing why people with PBS get gastrointestinal symptoms, and uh, we're also going to touch on how best to manage some of these symptoms. We're just going to talk about principles and okay so you can probably see uh, a picture of the of the gastrointestinal tract and what I really want to emphasize here is the fact that the gut is a long tube uh, it starts just at the level of the mouth then you have the esophagus which is the food pipe or the gullet it's it's often called which goes all the way down to the level of the junction between the esophagus and the stomach called the gastroesophageal junction and there is a small valve there which usually prevents the acid and stomach contents from going back up into the uh, into the esophagus after we've eaten. Then we've got the stomach and when the food arrives in the stomach the main function of the stomach is to mix it with acid so that acid can kill off the unhealthy bacteria that are there in our food and then it acts like a mixer and it basically mixes the acid with the food and breaks the food down into small particles and these small particles then trickle down into the small intestine or the small bowel where digestion takes place so in the small bowel all the nutrients are absorbed into the body and the waste then goes into the colon uh, or the large bowel where uh, after a long uh, journey through this large bowel which starts about here and um, and as the uh, uh, waste is traveling around the colon. The water is absorbed from this waste back into the body, um, and then the stool uh, is evacuated through through the rectum. If you look at the structure of the gut, when you see this picture, you've got a, a tubular structure here because we're looking at a cross section, and we look at the most inner layer uh, of the of the gut that is described as the mucosa and these finger-like projections that you see in the small intestine are called the villi and these help to increase the absorptive surface of the small intestine and just underneath this lining as shall we say of the of the gut is the sub mucosa layer where there are a lot of blood vessels but more importantly there is a layer of nerves in this area yeah? called the submucous plexus of nerves. Then we have two muscle layers. We have the inner circular layer and the outer longitudinal muscle layer. And again, the important point I want to make here is that there is a bunch of nerves between these two layers of the muscles called the myenteric plexus. So there are two major nerve uh, plexus in the, in the gut. And these nerves are really uh, very important in controlling gut function and they can almost autonomously control gut function even if all the nerves that are coming from the brain to the gut are severed the gut has the possibility of uh, maintaining its function uh, and maintaining the peristalsis which is a movement of the gut which allows the food to pass onwards and forwards so the other point to make is that the number of nerves in the gut are as many as the nerves in the spinal cord. So when there are problems with the nervous system in the gut, then there can be severe problems with movement of the gut, just like if there is a problem in the nervous system in the, in the brain or the spinal cord or the peripheral nerves, then we see consequences in movements, in, in sensation, etc. In, in our limbs and, and, and so on. Now if we look at this structure of the gut and see where uh, whether we can look at a further cross-section of that and see where the connective tissue is. So as you all know connective tissue is uh, a bunch of proteins which help to connect different tissues together and in some way acts as a cement which binds all the tissues and all the cells together. And one of the more important proteins which make up the connective tissue is collagen, 
and uh, there are but there are many other different types of proteins such as elastin fibers etc and as you can see that we're looking at the outer longitudinal muscle layer and you can see these long scaffolds of connective tissue which come down in the muscle which anchor the muscle but there are also specifically collagen fibers and elastin fibers and importantly a lot of these fibers are around the nerves in the myenteric plexus so these are the nerves between the longitudinal muscle that you can see over here and the circular muscle that you can see at the lower part of the picture and between these two there is a bunch of nerves and you see a lot of connective tissue fibers collagen and elastin fibers around these nerves as well and I'll talk to you about the relevance of this uh, a little bit later so when we think about connective tissue problems and how they may uh, affect the gut we think of it in three three main ways or three main mechanisms if there is a problem in the connective tissue as we've seen that it forms a important part of the structure of the of the muscle layers uh, of the of the gut and it is also uh, very close to the nerves there as well so you would expect that uh, there could be mechanical problems that develop in in the gut and you can also expect that uh, the gut may become more sensitive if the nerves are around which the connective tissue is quite extensively formed are affected by uh, defects in this uh, connective tissue and I'm also going to talk to you about why the gut may become a bit more leaky than usual if there are problems in the uh, in the connective tissue so let's look at the first uh, mechanism which is the mechanical problems that can uh, occur in the gut one way to explain this is using a very basic law of physics uh, which suggests that flow in any tubular structure depends on the elasticity of that tubular structure and as I showed you in my first slide the gut really is a long tube and flow of uh, fluid and food and stool everything obeys the basic law of physics now you will all be familiar with the fact that there is a lot of uh, metal pipes uh, or plumbing which actually brings water to your taps as for instance in your kitchen sink now what you can see here and what you know is that these taps are made of metal and there is a reason why these taps are made of metal because flow in a metallic tube will always be fast however if for some reason your plumber changes these tubes to a plastic tube then you can imagine that the flow will not be so good and that is because of the basic law of physics which suggests that in a tubular structure the speed of flow is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area which basically means that if the tube is wide the flow will be slow and if the tube is narrow the tube the flow will be faster but in reality it also relates to the fact of stiffness in a tube so a tube that is stiffer the, tube, the flow will be faster and a tube that is more elastic and stretchy the flow will be slower so it is therefore possible that just because we know that in EDS the elasticity of collagen is uh, is greater than usual therefore the uh, the gut can be a little bit more elastic and stretchy becomes a bit floppy and therefore movement uh, of food and fluid etc is a bit slower in this gut now when we think about this as a, a potential cause and I've already shown you that you know flow through a hose pipe compared to tap water coming out of your kitchen sink is different so that is the main reason because because flow through a solid tube or a tube which has less elasticity will be much faster than a flow through a tube which is uh, Yes, um, experience, and you will see on this slide that uh, another term, JHS, Joint Hypermobility Syndrome, is also used uh, because it is considered to be synonymous with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And this is an early paper from 2004 by Dr. Alan Akeem and Professor Rodney Graham, who are two major authorities 
in this condition have written very seminal papers. Uh, and in, in this research paper that they wrote, they looked at the range of symptoms that patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobility type can experience. And what you can clearly see is that patients with EDS or joint hypermobility syndrome experience quite a lot of gastrointestinal symptoms. Almost 35% of the had gastrointestinal symptoms um, in this particular series. There have been more studies which have compared patients with EDS with, um, with healthy volunteers and generally the the data suggests that uh, patients with EDS hypermobility type, they suffer from more acid reflux problems. Uh, so they get heartburn, they get regurgitation, uh, which means that food will repeat on itself. And, and that seems to be one of the common problems that they have. They also have other problems and other difficulty with eating. For instance, they feel full earlier after a meal they can uh, get a sensation of bloating or fullness or what we call postprandial distress or distress after a meal in which they can get pain, discomfort immediately after eating a meal. They can get problems with swallowing in that, that the, the, the esophagus is a little bit on the weak side and therefore you, you can get a feeling of, or a sensation of food sticking in the, in the gut. And then, of course, if as you move lower down the gut, uh, there are problems with constipation. Sometimes there are problems with diarrhea. And sometimes there is a combination of constipation and diarrhea uh, as well that patients can, can experience. Now, there are a number of functional gut disorders. These are disorders which are described as uh, conditions where a cause cannot be identified. So these are largely unexplained medical disorders. And there's a whole bunch of them, like functional dyspepsia, for instance, is a very common problem. And what we find is that there is a higher incidence of patients with Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility in patients with functional dyspepsia. In fact, this is one of the most common functional gut disorder that we found in our patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. In fact, what I should describe this is the fact that amongst a group of patients with functional dyspepsia, almost 50% met the criteria for the Stanley syndrome. So these are patients that describe burning discomfort in the upper part of the tummy, which um, can extend up towards the, uh, towards the chest. They can experience nausea and vomiting. They feel that there is a tightness or a band around the upper part of the abdomen and they feel quite bloated as well. And as I've said that we in our series, in, in, in the papers that we published, found it almost 50% prevalence of EDS in this population. And more recently, there's a, was an abstract presented at the uh, American Gastroenterology meeting from a group in Leuven in Belgium who are also experts in managing this condition called functional dyspepsia and they've reported a prevalence of for around 58%. So groups other than us have independently shown that the uh, syndrome is quite common in this uh, group of patients. I've already mentioned about acid reflux problems. This was again a common symptom that we found in our patients with, with the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and we're currently doing a lot more work to look at why patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome tend to get more reflux symptoms and it appears that the esophagus or the gullet is more sensitive to acid reflux in patients with EDS. This is just some preliminary data that I'm telling you about which we are currently working on. And the vast majority of patients experience acid reflux without actually inflammation in the, in the esophagus. So if they have a camera test down like an endoscopy, quite often there is no increase in inflammation that is seen in the, in the esophagus. Now, therefore, we now know from the research that has been done that, they, that patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome do experience quite a lot of gut symptoms. And the question is, 
why is it that they are experiencing all these all these symptoms and of course we've talked about swallowing problems so we've started studying why patients with uh, Lestalis syndrome experience more difficulty with swallowing and we know that the process of swallowing requires a core which is sequential movements which lead to downward progression of the bolus of food that we've just swallowed. And we can measure this peristalsis or the contractions that occur in the esophagus by putting in a catheter or a small tube in the esophagus which measures, which has got pressure sensors on it and which measures pressures uh, as the bolus of food moves down the esophagus. So if you look at this screen over here, at the upper end is a valve or a sphincter called the upper softal sphincter. And the, the colors represent the, the strength of contraction that is occurring. As you can see, the higher colors, red, orange, and yellows, and these are the high pressure zones. So this is, valve is normally fully closed, and you see high pressure zone over here. And you see another high pressure zone at the lower end of the esophagus where you have the lower esophageal sphincter. You can see it better over here. But as soon as we swallow, the pressure here drops because this valve opens up. Um, but then there is an increase in pressure which is progressive. It actually moves down the esophagus. So this is the pressure wave or the peristaltic wave that is moving down the esophagus towards the stomach. And that progression suggests that the bolus is progressively moving down. And as soon as we start to swallow, the sphincter at the lower end of the esophagus relaxes to allow the food to come down into the stomach. This is what we see in healthy subjects, and this is what we see in our patients, that when they swallow, there is normal relaxation of the sphincter at the top end, the upper esophageal sphincter, but thereafter the pressure waves if are quite low in intensity, as you can see. The pressure waves here are quite high in the range of red and orange, and over here, we're looking at blues and greens, which means that the movements of the esophagus are a bit weak. And that is why some patients, and I have to emphasize that not all patients experience this symptom, can experience this difficulty with swallowing and the food not going down properly and getting, getting stuck. Now, we also talked about the fact that patients get dyspeptic or indigestion-like symptoms or feeling of fullness uh, immediately after meals. They often feel they cannot finish a meal completely and they can get quite bloated. We know, as I've mentioned before, that the stomach is a, is a large hollow organ and its function is to really uh, mix the food with the acid and then to churn it into small pieces and then to move that those small pieces down into the small intestine, the upper part of the small intestine is called the duodenum. To do that, the stomach needs to contract and squeeze the food out gradually. And if these contractions of the stomach are a bit weak, then you can expect that the stomach is not going to empty properly, and you're gonna have a residue lying in the stomach like this for much longer than it should do. And that will often give a feeling of fullness and a feeling of bloating, reduce the appetite, and when you put in more food on top of that, then you're going to get full up much more quickly. And this can sometimes also lead to nausea and vomiting. So what we find in some of our patients is that the stomach emptying and emptying of food from the stomach is delayed. In a subgroup of patients, this is much more severe and is described as gastroparesis. But sometimes in, in a subgroup of patients, we also find that the emptying from the stomach is rapid. And this is something that we are very intrigued by and are studying in more detail. And we get sometimes more rapid emptying of uh, food from the stomach into the small intestine. But that can also cause symptoms because more rapid entrance of food into the small intestine, which is much narrower than the stomach can also lead to symptoms of that due to increased distension in the uh, in the in, in the and in the upper part of the small intestine, and that can also lead to a condition called dumping syndrome, where the food which has also often got quite a lot of sugar in it 
dumps down into the small intestine quickly, which causes a sudden rise in blood sugar and the sudden rise in an excretion of insulin, which can then drop the blood sugar down to quite low levels. And, and some patients describe what we call reactive hypoglycemia after a meal. And these are patients in the stomach is emptying much more rapidly than it should do. It has been described that um, some patients with um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome get hydrocenia, although we have not seen a very high incidence of hydrocenia in our most recent series, but there is a publication which describes that the hydrocenia incidence is high. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is that under normal circumstances, the most of the esophagus is above the level of the diaphragm. Diaphragm is a large muscle which divides the chest, separates the chest cavity from the abdominal cavity. And the esophagus comes down to meet the stomach through a small hole in this diaphragm called the hiatus. And therefore, the vast majority of the uh, stomach is below this hiatus and below the diaphragm, and the vast majority of the esophagus is above the diaphragm. And a hiatus hernia, which is shown on the right over here, this hiatus or this hole in the diaphragm is much wider or lax, and therefore, a bit of the stomach herniates up into the chest cavity. This can be sometimes temporary because there you can get a sliding hydrocenia which moves up and down and sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't when you have an endoscopy and sometimes it is more permanent. And in patients with hydrocenia there is a high risk of acid reflux because the diaphragm is not supporting the lower end of the esophagus as it should do because the lower end of the esophagus is now much higher up and therefore that can produce more acid reflux type of symptoms. Now, coming to constipation, which is again a common problem that we see in our patients with EDS, I just wanted to talk to you about the normal anatomy of the rectum with the other pelvic organs. As you can see, this is the, the rectum which opens into the anal canal. And in some of our patients with EDS, what we see is that there is a formation of what we call a rectocele, which is a bulge that forms in the rectum, which sort of moves forward towards the pelvic cavity, and sometimes food can be, uh, stool can be trapped in that pouch. We also sometimes see what is called an intersusception, which means that the rectum folds onto itself. Instead of squeezing the stool out, it flops onto itself, much like a concertina effect, and therefore it causes an obstruction because the bowel is folded onto itself. And it tends to happen if you are, particularly if our patients training to empty their bowels, then they're more likely to get this feeling of blockage caused by this intersusception, which is basically folding of the bowel on its own. So this can cause what we describe as rectal evacuatory dysfunction, that the stool, stool may still arrive in the rectum at a normal speed, but then it is very difficult to evacuate it. And quite often the pelvic flow muscles do not work in a coordinated manner to evacuate the stool, and hence there can be a lot of straining that can be involved. But of course, some of our patients have a combination of this evacuatory dysfunction together with slow movements of the rest of the colon, or what we call slow transit constipation. Now, if you imagine that what we've described to you so far is that overall there is a mechanical dysfunction in the gut. It is not moving as well as it should do. And therefore, this problem with movement will lead to stagnation. So food, fluid, stool will all stagnate in the, in the gut. And that will lead to overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria. And you will, uh, you will all recognize the fact that whenever there is stagnation, there is unhealthy uh, uh, bacteria that, that are growing. For instance, you never drink water from a pond because the water there is stagnant and it is full of bacteria, but you will, if you're really stuck in a, a forest somewhere and need to drink water from a running stream or a river, then you can do that because water, running water is much more cleaner than static water. And therefore, you get overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria. Now, you know that the gut is full of bacteria. It's got trillions of healthy bacteria. They're very important in, in helping us to digest our food, they help to regulate our immune system, 
and in, for normal health, it is critically important that our gut bacteria are healthy. But in a more stagnant system, a system which is not moving very well, you start to get unhealthy bacteria growing um, in the gut. They start to ferment the food and that releases a lot of gases and a lot of toxic substances which can cause not just bloating but can cause cramping abdominal pain and can also lead to diarrhea because eventually the bacterial overgrowth gets to a stage where that fermentation starts to affect the digestion of fat and you start to get malabsorption of fat. So some of our patients describe very oily, fatty looking stools which float on the water, are difficult to fry, flush, quite strong in smell. They often describe other symptoms like change in their taste or a very coated tongue, etc. as well, which can all be manifestations of unhealthy bacteria growing. fermentation is occurring which are not healthy and some of our patients also describe a feeling of tiredness and fatigue when they have uh, bacterial overgrowth. Can you hear me? If you can hear me I'm just going to stop for a while just to make sure that I'm still connected. Um, just bear with me. All right, fantastic. I, Understand that I'm still connected. Okay, brilliant. Um, so we were talking about POTS, partial tachycardia syndrome. In POTS, you have symptoms of dizziness and sometimes fainting will change in posture. And one of the mechanisms is that the, there is pooling of blood in the in the legs, in the veins, which are also long tubes. And if they are more sluggish than usual, then you can get pooling of blood in the legs. And when you change posture, then the blood doesn't go back into circulation as quickly as it should do. And in that time lag you can experience dizziness, palpitations, uh, and sometimes fainting. But these symptoms are also described by some of our patients after a meal, particularly a large meal and a meal which has got a lot of carbohydrates. And if you look at the structure of the gut, you see that in the, in the abdomen, there are a lot of blood vessels as well. So this is again a picture of the gut, and you can see that there is a large blood vessel over here, which is um, called the uh, celiac trunk to the, to the upper part of the gut. You've got the superior mesenteric artery, the inferior mesenteric artery, which supplies the lower end of the gut, and there's a big aorta right in the middle over here. And when we eat, there is increase in blood flow to the tummy organs, and that, that is quite often why a lot of parents say to their children, don't run after you've just eaten, and that the reason why they're saying that, even if they don't know that reason, is that there is increase in blood flow occurring to the blood, uh, to the organs of the gut to aid and help with the digestion, and therefore there is less blood in the in the limbs, etc. And if you start running around, then you divert that blood from your tummy, tummy cavity back into your systemic uh, circulation, and therefore there will be less blood available for helping digest the food uh, properly. So, so when we eat, there is a dilatation or expansion of the blood vessels, and that may be why in patients with POTS who are not running on a low blood pressure, drainage of more blood into the tummy cavity after eating, and it may well be that there is a sluggishness of blood circulation in the tummy cavity as well, and this could lead to a feeling of lightheadedness, fatigue, drowsiness, and we have some patients who actually have fainted after a meal, particularly if they stand up quickly after a meal. But nausea and bloating can also be features that we see in POTS because I have some patients with quite severe nausea in whom treatment of POTS has improved the nausea as well as the bloating, bloating as well. So it's worth keeping in mind that in patients with POTS, tummy symptoms can also occur and sometimes POTS can be triggered after a large meal. We've been talking about mechanical problems in the gut so far, but I just want to now touch on the increase in sensitivity that occurs in the gut as well. I've already explained to you that there are a lot of there is a lot of connective tissue, collagen and elastin fibers around the nerves in the gut. And very recently, and I don't expect you to follow this in any great detail, there is another connective tissue protein, which is called Tenaskin X. In Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome hypermobility type, or type 3, 
is sometimes called, 5%, 5 to 10% of patients may have a defect in the Tanaski next type of connective tissue, and it's a genetic defect. And they get quite severe symptoms as well. And we've actually recently been doing some research on a knockout mouse model of Tanaskin X. So this is a mouse where the Tanaskin X gene has been deleted. And this mouse becomes very hypermobile and has a lot of tummy problems, uh, tummy problems as well with movements as a very sluggish gut and also quite a sensitive gut. And what we found was that in the red, you can see that you can look at the two nerve plexus that I described before, the myenteric plexus and the submucous plexus. And in red, you can see that there is staining of these nerves with tenaskin X. And in green, what you see is staining of these nerves with another type of chemical which binds to a particular type of nerve called cholinergic nerves, which are nerves that increase the muscle contractions of the, uh, of the gut. And when we put these two together, we call it a merging of the two pictures. We actually see that there is a lot of orange there. They're not separated, but what these two nerves completely, tenaskin X, which is a connective tissue protein, and these calretinin nerves they completely overlap in both of these mucous plexus, suggesting that there is very tight communication uh, between the uh, nerves and these extracellular matrix. So it would not be surprising that if there are problems in the connective tissue, then there would also be problems in these nerves. These, this could lead to both problems with movement of the muscles, but also problems with sensation in the gut. And we've done specifically some studies in this mouse model on how sensitive the vagus nerve, which is the most major nerve, which carries sensation from the gut to the brain, and we found that that nerve is quite sensitive in this mouse model. Let's talk about leaky gut, and this is a phrase that you may have heard before, that the gut becomes more leaky, therefore there are more food antigens that are getting through this leaky gut into, into the circulation, which can cause the immune system to get overactive. Now let's look at the structure of the connective tissue. We know that connective tissue is one of the four different types of tissues in the gut. You've got cells in the lining of the gut which are called the sort of epithelial cells. You've got the nervous tissue and you've got the muscle tissue. All of the structures in the gut but all the structures and swear are made of these four structures. And if you actually look in detail as to what is actually happening over here, what we see is that there are a lot of immune cells which are in very close contact with these connective tissue fibers um, over here. And these, some of these immune cells are called the mast cells. Mast cells are often the first line of defense of our immune system and they attack an invader or a protein that is foreign to the body and for instance, people who get hay fever are well familiar or when they get into contact with pollen, then these mast cells become uh, pretty active. But what I really wanted to emphasize is that these mast cells are in very close contact with, with these connective tissue proteins. Now, the gut also has these um, cells in the lining, and these cells are very tightly bound together to one another. And they don't allow bacteria or food particles to get through between these gaps. Between the, There are no gaps between the cells. So all of the absorption actually occurs. All the nutrients get absorbed through the cell. So the cell can pick and choose, okay, I need a certain type of nutrient and I'll absorb it. And I don't need a certain type of nutrient, I won't absorb it. And that also allows the cells to choose, okay, there are certain proteins and certain chemicals in the food that are harmful uh, for the body and therefore we will exclude that. So the immune system is, which is just behind these lines of cells, is generally quite happy in this um, sort of situation. However, in a gut which is unhealthy, for instance, if there's inflammation in the lining of the gut or if there is bacterial overgrowth which then causes low overactivity of the immune system and that you know, and can lead to then the changes in the integrity of these cells. So now gaps appear between these cells. 
and therefore all these bacteria and food particles which have, should have been blocked, food proteins, they are now getting through. And when they get through, then you get uh, uh, the immune system of the body getting activated, causing an inflammatory response. And as I said, that the first line of defense or the bouncer, which is actually standing just behind these gates, behind the cells, is the mast cells. And the mast cells produces a large number of chemicals. And so the, the, the mast cell secretes these chemicals on the embedding proteins in an attempt to get rid of them. And an analogy is that when, for those of you who suffer from hay fever like I do, when pollen enters the eyes, you get these antibodies that are formed uh, against the pollen. And these antibodies then connect to the mast cells, and the mast cells then, then open up and they start secreting the histamine, which makes our eyes quite red and itchy and our nose quite congested and runny. And imagine the same sort of problem occurring in the gut, because the gut is full of immune cells. It is the largest immune organ of the body. And therefore, in the same way as we get this reaction to the pollen, you could be getting reaction to certain food particles in the gut, which then causes mast cell overactivity over there and the release of a lot of histamine, but not just histamine, there are many other chemicals which set up a... And, and this histamine is related and overactivity of the mast cells is not just related to the gut. There are many, many symptoms that are described in patients who have mast cell overactivity. This can range from vertigo to headaches to nausea, vomiting, cardiac problems, problems in the gut with diarrhea, cramps, feeling of a lot of gas or wind in the abdomen, but even in the pelvic structures, in the respiratory tract, in the skin, with the skin feeling very hot and flushed, and, and some patients um, go on to develop urticaria, which is uh, an allergic reaction, and you can develop a raised uh, lumpy skin rash, which is like often described as hives as well. And once you develop a leaky gut, that barrier that has been protecting you from all the chemicals and drug, bacteria, etc., that barrier is broken. And now quite a lot of these patients start to develop reactions to foods that they're eating, developing food allergies and intolerance. The immune system starts to go a bit haywire. And that is also described as a basis of autoimmune diseases. And, and there is a, a suggestion that in patients with EDS, there is an increased incidence of other uh, immune system normalities as well. Now, just moving on to how we study the, the gut in our patients with, with EDS, we have a number of techniques that are available to us to assess gut function. Now, when you go to your doctors, most of the studies that are done are looking at the structure. You may have an endoscopy, you may have an X-ray, you may have a scan, and all of these are looking at the structure of the gut, um, not really the function of the gut. It's unfortunate that studies of the function of the gut are not performed as commonly as perhaps they should and not available as widely as they should be. I already talked to you about the technique where we measure pressures in the esophagus. This is called esophageal manometry. But we can also, in our patients with acid reflux, uh, do a, what we call a 24-hour pH and impedance test, which involves leaving a small tube in the in the esophagus over 24 hours, which has got sensors for acid and, and bile, etc., and it can measure how much acid is coming up into your esophagus over a 24-hour period. Similarly, we've got a gastric emptying test that is available, where after a meal, we can measure breath samples, or we can do a radioisotope study, where you go into a gamma camera, and that measures how well this food is emptying from the stomach into your small intestine, and if this emptying is very slow, then you know we know that that could be responsible for your symptoms. Just like we have esophageal manometry to measure pressures in the esophagus, we have a technique called small bowel manometry, which measures pressures in the small bowel to see if it's functioning normally. And we have a range of colonic function tests which measure transit in the, in the colon, and we can also do studies to look at evacuatory dysfunction by doing proctograms, which is a, involves passage of a small amount of barium into the rectum and allow patients to evacuate it, and we can see whether the bowel is collapsing on itself or whether there is a rectocele. And for patients who have bacterial overgrowth, who have symptoms of bacterial overgrowth, we've got these hydrogen breath tests where we give a strong sugar like lact and, and uh, lactulose 
on glucose and see how much fermentation is occurring of that sugar by measuring the amount of hydrogen coming out in the bread. And the hydrogen bread test can also be used to identify whether patients have lactose or fructose intolerance. So there's a whole range of fun these functional tests that are available and you can discuss that with your physician to see if those are uh, indicated to try and understand your symptoms. Moving on to just basic simple principles of, of treatment for gut problems that we use in our patients. Now the first thing that I would like to mention is that a lot of our EDS patients have pain as a very major symptom and it may not just be pain arising from the tummy but it could be pain in the muscles and joints and ligaments and so on due to dislocations etc. And in chronic pain there is always a temptation that if other painkillers are not working then they get given these opioid painkillers uh, which are morphine related or uh, morphine derivatives and these can be very harmful for the gut and in the long term these opioid painkillers actually do not necessarily reduce the pain that much but they can have actually an increased rebound effect but certainly in a already sluggish gut um, use of opioid painkillers can severely uh, affect gut function and, and uh, cause quite a lot of symptoms. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, etc. Pain modulators like amitriptyline and the gabapentin or pregabalin, etc. Uh, can be used. And in a proportion of our patients with uh, chronic abdominal pain, we often find that the pain is actually coming not from the organs of the gut, but it is coming from the muscles of the abdominal wall. And, and then just like you can get trigger points on your back and other areas like fibromyalgia, you can get similar trigger points on the tummy wall. And quite often when a patient comes to me and says, oh, I'm in pain 24-7 and the pain is always in the same spot, then I have a high suspicion that this is likely to be a muscular pain. Uh, rather than a pain coming from the from the gut, and we have had very good responses to trigger point injections with local anesthetic and steroid, just like local anesthetic and steroid injections can be used to treat joint pains and other trigger points uh, elsewhere in the body. So it's worth keeping this in in mind. Dietary based treatments are very important. In fact, we now believe that one of the major ways in improving not just gut symptoms but global symptoms in the rest of the body, then dietary management can be incredibly helpful. Some of our, and this is largely been related to some of the education that we've had from our patients um, themselves because they found cutting out certain foods has been helpful. For instance, cutting out gluten from the diet, some patients find very helpful, some patients find cutting out milk products very helpful. And there's a diet that we use quite a lot in our patients, uh, particularly with a lot of bloating and also cramping as well as diarrhea, that these FODMAPs, these are foods that are more highly fermentable uh, than usual and these, you can find a lot of literature and I've got some resources on this slide that you can look at. The Monash University Low FODMAP Diet, uh, FONAP is quite useful, but King's College Hospital in London have quite about this as well. And there are other resources like Shepard, uh, uh, and that uh, by reducing these fermentable carbohydrates, they get less fermentation and there is an improvement in their gut bacteria as well. Now, this is quite a big topic really, um, the management of EDS patients with, with diet. And, and there is, we ourselves are doing some work on this. Uh, I've got a close colleague, Lisa Jameson, who is working with me. She's doing a master's in nutrition at the moment and she's got some excellent ideas about um, the use of um, dietary treatment in EDS. And, and of course, um, there are other colleagues as well who uh, are using dietary management and you may have heard of Heidi Collins in the USA who has written quite a lot about the role of diet in EDS. And this is an area of uh, quite prime importance for us in terms of research. Uh, and we hope to come up with more data related to that. You may have heard of low histamine diets and certainly these 
can be helpful in some of our patients where we suspect that there is a lot of mast cell activation causing release of histamine, etc. And in these patients, a low histamine diets can be helpful. And in these patients, we sometimes use antihistamines as well as mast cell stabilizers. There are medicines um, like sodium chromoglycate, nalchrom is the trade name for that, um, that we can use in some of our patients to try and help reduce these uh, histamine-related reactions. There is really very little literature on the use of vitamins and minerals in patients with EDS. And this paper by uh, Dr. Castori has tried to summarize what evidence that is out there. And uh, it seems that uh, using uh, multivitamins, but particularly vitamin C, vitamin D, can be quite important in EDS patients. And certainly some of our EDS patients are coming and telling us about the benefit they've received from using high doses sometimes of uh, vitamin C. But vitamin D deficiency is, is quite common in our EDS patients as well. And, and also some of our patients find benefit from using magnesium-based preparations can help to reduce nerve pain, but also some of our patients with constipation can benefit from the use of magnesium supplements. And I would recommend that you discuss that with your physician if you think that that may be helpful. In patients who get full up very quickly and have delayed gastric emptying, we often advise them to eat small meals regularly, but it's critically important that the food that you eat is nutritious and is not based on processed carbs, uh, etc. and uh, you try and follow the you know, principles of, um, of healthy eating because every mouthful that you take should, um, should count really and therefore it has to be nutritious food. But eating small amounts frequently can help to reduce some of the symptoms that you get after meals and also reduce any POTS-like symptoms that may be occurring. But it's important is that if you're having small amounts, then you have them frequently so that you get enough calories and you maintain your nutrition. It is important to try and keep the stools soft and sometimes adding fiber can help, but we also, through using prunes and so on, but a lot of our patients find that adding fiber will cause bloating. And in these patients, using more synthetic fiber preparations such as Movicol can be helpful. It tends to produce less bloating than some of the other fiber preparations and fruits and vegetables and so on sometimes can do. Uh, we often, Movicol acts as a, it's a regulated solution which acts to soften the stool, but we sometimes have to combine that with the stimulant laxatives such as Senecot or Dulcolax, and the combination works better. But in our more severe end of the spectrum patients, there is a medicine called Resolor or Procalopride, which I think is probably not available in the USA at the moment, but it's available here in Europe, and it helps to stimulate motility, colonic motility, colonic movements, uh, and makes it easier to pass um, stools. And some patients with evacuatory dysfunction, in particular who are having uh, a lot of difficulty in evacuating their stool and having to strain quite a lot, sometimes the use of glycine suppositories and even enemas can be helpful. In those with rectal evacuatory dif difficulty, we often refer these patients to our specialist colorectal nurses for biofeedback therapy, which basically involves improvement of pelvic flow function through feedback that is received through the computer screen when exercises, pelvic exercises are, are being done. And very rarely will we refer patients for surgery, but this may be necessary in those who've developed a prolapse of the rectum, et cetera. Probiotics are healthy bacteria, which can help to normalize the gut bacterial flora. And these are now available in commercial preparations. This is just Probiot 7 is just one of the preparations that is available in the UK. There are many others that are available as well. And we tend to usually suggest use of probiotics with multiple strains in them. Quite often, if there is very definite evidence of bacterial overgrowth, we may treat with a course of antibiotics, often use low FODMAP diet in these patients, and also give probiotics to try and prevent further bacterial overgrowth problems occurring in the future. It is important generally to keep active. Exercise helps bowel function as well, particularly constipation will, will improve. And basically, just to summarize that from our research, but from other colleagues who have been working in this area, it's very clear that 
gut symptoms do occur in patients with Ehlers Danlos syndrome. They can be quite, quite common and relate to the entire gastrointestinal tract, but some of our patients describe more symptoms in the upper gut, some of the patients describe more symptoms in the lower gut, and some patients have a combination of upper gut and lower gut symptoms, symptoms as well. And I think it is important now to recognize that Ehlers-Danlos syndrome really is a multi-systemic condition which involves symptoms in a lot of different systems, but gastrointestinal symptoms form an important part of this condition. And generally the recognition of that is improving, particularly in Europe it is improving. I'm not so sure about the US, but there are one or two centers in the US that are looking at this and doing some research in this area as well. And there is definitely a need for now multidisciplinary teams for managing patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And in the UK, we have a multidisciplinary team in our hospital. There's also one at the, the private sector at St. John and Elizabeth Hospital. Um, and we're looking to try and commission services uh, for EDS patients in our hospital, and we're currently working on that. So with that, I'd just like to thank you for listening to this webinar, and I'd also like to thank uh, many colleagues of mine who have been very helpful in, uh, in performing the research that we've done. Asma Fikri has been our PhD student who's done quite a lot of work on the data that I've presented to you. And of course, Professor Rodney Graham who has been a mentor throughout the process that, you know, of my interest in this area. In fact, he's the one who diagnosed the, helped me to diagnose the first patient when I first moved to London from Manchester. And that is how we became very interested in this condition. Professor Chris Mathias, who is a world authority on the management of POTS, and I share a lot of patients with him. Dr. Alan Akeem is a very close colleague who is a rheumatologist who also has a very specific interest in EDS. I work closely with Mr. Vic Kular, who is a urogynecologist uh, who has helped really in, with our patients with urogynecological problems. Dr. Adam Farmer was also my PhD student who did quite a lot of work uh, on the gastrointestinal manifestation of EDS, Dr. Anna Kaskas. Again, she's a rheumatologist at University College Hospital. We work closely with her. Dr. Surinjit Sanavaratne is an immunologist with an interest in, in mast cell activation disorder, and uh, we share quite a lot of patients with them. And of course, uh, Lara, who's been supportive to us while she was with EDS UK, and now as a CEO of the EDS Society. She's doing a fantastic job and I'm always grateful to her support for our work. Rosemary Kerr and Jane Simmons are two excellent uh, physiotherapists and I'm very grateful to them as well because we've shared quite a lot of patients with them as well. So thank you very much.